Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the Rusty Quill Gaming Podcast, an actual play podcast for extended tabletop campaign. And we're coming to you from London, England. Uh, I'm your host and Game Master Alex Newell and with me I have... Lydia Nicholas. Ben Meredith. Bryn Monroe. James Ross. And brief words about what your characters are? Uh, I play Sasha. She is a slightly awkward ex-antiques appraiser who moves a little too silently and stabs a little too hard for anyone to believe that's her whole past. <laughs> um, Dow, a cleric of Poseidon, ex-sailor and pirate, now erstwhile mercenary uh, band leader. <laughs> you sound so much more hardcore. Oh, Zolf Smith as well, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, I am playing Hamid, the playboy halfling sorcerer. <laughs> Uh, I am Sir Bertrand Bertie McGuffingham, uh, a posh idiot uh, who likes hitting things quite hard. <laughs> cool. And uh, where we left off last week, uh, Lord Edison in his uh, townhouse had just stepped out uh, onto a stage uh, for the reveal of his next big thing. And all of you had managed to get yourselves in by hook or by crook or mostly by Lord Bertie. Wellington <laughs> being... <laughs> so, <clears throat> Edison... Uh, Steps out and led by uh, Hamid, I believe it was. There's a, a polite round of applause. He, he waves it down, gestures behind him. A curtain pulls apart and a cart. There are four guards, two pushing it to either side. Push forward a cart. Um, in sort of terms of game mechanics, the, the cart is large. So that's sort of 10 foot by 10 foot, give or take. And the thing upon it is around about the 10 foot tall mark, something like that. Um, it's draped in a large white cloth, very hard to pick out a form. It's cuboid, taller than it is um, wide, but there's no real discerning of it. It's it, like It looks like it's probably in a box or something. Um, but they wheel it out and the guards are being very, very careful to sort of look around and so on. Um, in the room, there are sort of the creme de la creme of uh, upper London society, uh, lords, ladies, statesmen, that kind of thing. Um, there's a f- couple of other guards, but it's mostly up towards the um, the stage area for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a lectern to the right-hand side of the stage, stage right for anyone who is using their thing. So I suppose that'd be the left from the audience. Oh, it's been a while. It's been a while since I had to remember that. And on stage left, which would be the right-hand side, if you're sat in the audience, there's a grand piano. And um, again, there's someone who's been playing a little bit of underscoring as Edison walks out. Um, everyone hushes and the music goes down. Is it worth doing a perception check? Uh, yeah, that? please, feel free. Um, anytime you want to do a perception check, go for it. I'll just let you know if it's a waste of time. Uh, okay, two, uh, eight in total. Eight. Uh, you notice there are also a couple of um, sort of waiters who are just holding like trays of empty glasses up towards the back near you and Zolf. Um, but they're just stood there. I mean, there's nothing really extra to discern at the moment. Um, so yeah, Edison steps up to a lectern and uh, <clears throat> he sort of reaches down, pulls a lever. How subtly do you think it's possible to cast Detect Magic? Um, well, what is the description of it? Does it have a vocal or somatic component? Uh, yeah, it's got almost every spell has both yeah. verbal and somatic. I should, I should spell out, actually, for listeners who aren't familiar with the sort of tabletop things. Um, a lot of spells have a vocal or a somatic component and there's some other ones which have some others but what it comes... It's very common to have uh, material components sure. as well but as a sorcerer I eschew materials. Yeah. Uh, so a cleric I do the same. So with those materials it's talking about what are required for the casting of magic. Um, so a vocal component is that you have to speak. It defines it as it has to be audible like so that you can't you know, be stood behind someone and do it silently. There are, like, feats you can take so that that allows you to do things silently, uh, but there's no way you have that level one. A somatic component it is it requires sort of gesture, hand gestures. Um, it's the equivalent of, if you think of Gandalf holding his big staff up, that's a vocal component and a, a somatic component because he's got to hold the staff up and he's also got to go... Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then the material components are stuff like, oh, in order to set this person on fire, I would need Eye of Newt and also a Lit Flame, which the way the game covers it is they give you these these bags um, <laughs> which hold all useful components that aren't expensive, which is kind of a get-out clause, but a lot of them, the cleric and the sorcerer, just don't need them because they're kind of naturally imbued well, with this stuff or day. My god does it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you basically go, oi, oi, Poseidon, need a hand. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Those silly wizards who have to study and memorise for mm-hmm. years, they need them, not yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, they get some of the more exotic-y spells, but faff, you know? Admin, paperwork, who likes that? I mean, we're, we're role players. it's not like we like huge amounts of paperwork and math. <laughs> um, where was I? Edison, yes. So, he uh, steps up, pulls a lever on the... There's a faint hum, and um, his voice is coming out sort of from across the room, and you look up and notice some kind of unobtrusive speakers have been worked into the... Um, into the ceilings and stuff. We have speakers in yeah. this world. Yeah, cool. there's there's electricity. Good, cool. Um, and basically, there's a. <clears throat> is it on? Tap tap tap. Oh, hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am very very pleased to see all of you here today. Um, naturally, uh, this is a monumental occasion for myself, but I like to think that all of you are going to be having a good time as well. Um. The, the food's on me, obviously, so is the drink. Uh, some of you having a bit more than others. I'm looking at you, Byron. Uh, but so, obviously, I'm, I'm prattling. I'm not a talker. It's not what I'm here for. I'm an inventor. I invent things. That's what I do. So. <laughs> this guy rolled a low charisma check. He is not a charismatic <laughs> man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, enough about me prattling and prattling about prattling. <laughs> Am I right? I, I'm right. I, I, I'm always right. Um, but you see here behind you, behind me even, the uh, the sum total of my recent year's work. I would like to think that um, if the lightning rail made the world smaller, this is going to make the world bigger in a really exciting way. <laughs> so, obviously, there are a lot of you here. You'll notice that there are representatives. We have uh, we have a few of our uh, our representatives from Japan over there, and a couple from France. Hello. Um, naturally, um, what a lot of you are aware of is this is going to be an auction because I am a private citizen who likes having nice things. And the way I get nice things is I sell things. So this is going to be to the highest bidder, although I suspect we're all going to be getting one very soon. (laughs) So, without further ado, I give you... I'm sorry, I can't help myself. I give you the simulacrum. He sort of reaches up and tries to pull the um, sheet off in one go. It doesn't really... He's not particularly glamorous. Eventually, he sort of gestures to the guards who roll their eyes, pull it off, revealing a crate. He then uh, reaches across and sort of undoes a latch. And then he goes, The simulacrum pulls it and all of the you know sides of the crate open and reveal a humanoid. Um, ten foot tall, uh, shining, um, very, very like burnished. Um, and yeah, it, it looks... I suppose the closest thing you could think of is a robot, but there's a bit more to it than that. He's um, he or it, I should say, large, um, huge parts of sheet metal put to him. Um, so it's very smooth, very burnished, shining. Um, the joints look like they've got um, sort of white materials. Do any of you have knowledge engineering, anything like that? No. Nope. I was supposed to have some mechanical, wasn't I? I think you are covering it in disabled device, but engineering and disabled device aren't quite the same thing. No, they're not. You're more for the dealing of components rather than like large complex yeah. machinery. Um, that's fine. So you notice that it's got um, the metal has a very peculiar um, sort of visual quality to it. It's got lots of walls, as in W H O R L, like kind of swirly patterns in it. Um, I would say actually, Sasha, give me a perception roll. <laughs> Three, um, which which turns into ten. The rest of you notice that the metal is unusual. Sasha, you've seen a version of that metal before. You can't quite place it. Mm. Um, it's it's an unusual metal, and that would help you. Sort of, if you were to go away, you could figure out what it was. It's just it's kind of eluding you at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's not covered in precious stones, but it's very much. Would a knowledge arcana check reveal any help? Um, certainly, version? give it a knowledge arcana check. Uh, two plus seven. Not really. It's a machine. Yeah. Um, whilst it doesn't have like precious stones built onto it or things, you're seeing certain gleams at like elbow joints and knee joints and things, what look like sort of gold wires or tendons or something. Like clearly there's quite a lot of expensive stuff in there. And um, Is it worth a knowledge nobility check to see if there's anything that relates to uh, like its origin of manufacture or anything like that if it's a, or is not, that a bit not, of a stretch? Not really. Okay. Um, knowledge ability is more to do with the 
people and things yeah. to indicate them rather people than people and heraldry. Yeah, mostly. well, it was the heraldry angle I was thinking of in case there was any heraldic significance. There, at a glance, well. there's not. Okay. To say if you cool. recall, fine. Um, and it stands there. It's very, very tall. Um, it has a genderless figure. Um, you could It doesn't have like particularly broad shoulders and narrow waist, reminiscent of a man. But similarly, it doesn't have the the curves you'd associate with a woman. It's very much. Um, sort of a blank humanoid template almost. Edison kind of looks at you and goes, I know, right? I know, right? Look at it. It's, it's brilliant. I mean, look at it. This is so shiny. I, I like the shiny ones. But um, no, in all seriousness, and uh, this is the simulacrum. Say hello. There's kind of a lot of bemused faces. Byron in the back. Hello! Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I do a, a perception check on Byron? Mm -hmm. um, what you're, what are you trying to discern? Uh, his general state of mind and health and sure. well-being. Thirteen. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, minus one, so that's twelve. Healthy and drunk. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's Byron. That's Byron. Healthy. That's our Byron. <laughs> drunk. Um, so yeah, Edison. Basically, he reaches over and goes, oh, "I forget my own head, honestly." If I wasn't so amazing, I'm sure you'd all be worried. Ha! <laughs> Reaches up, sort of tweaks a little something, and then suddenly the, the um, simulacrum gives a little bit of a shudder. And then it stands up a little bit straighter. You see the eyes grow, start to glow with sort of a golden colour. And then it just sort of turns its head. And the first thing you see is very smooth, very graceful. It's not juddering, it's not robotic. Now, of course, many of you will be aware that there are clockwork servants around. Primitive, primitive, horrible things. Clanky, clickety, ugh, don't like them. They can do the same job again and again. Very boring. Who wants that? No one wants that. It's terrible. It's useless. But this, this is the next thing. Aren't you? Say hello. Thing sort of turns around and examines its hand for a moment. Hello. I know, right? It's great. But the thing is, is obviously, I mean, a big tall thing. It can move. Great. Why, why, why would you want this? Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just a, a thing, okay? This is this is as close to a person as there can be. In I, I would argue, potentially, it is a person. A person with an off switch, but, you know, hit someone over the head and they'll fall down, I'm told. Um, so, this this is this is the next thing. You need someone strong? He's, he's, he's strong, she's strong. I, I, I don't really know. I didn't bother with the bits. But more than that, this is a person that's able to make more of itself. You don't need two to make this. No, 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 people, people... People take two. Two's rubbish. This can make more of itself on its own. You buy one of these, and you're not buying this. What you're buying is all of them. They're all yours. You just tell this guy, go make more of yourself. The uh, machine sort of turns, looks, starts to walk away. No, no, not now, now, no, stay, stay. <laughs> but what you have here is the potential for an entirely new industry. An entirely new industry. The workforce, you won't need them. This 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 can do that job. Yes, he may not be the smartest thing yet, but give him time. What what you have here is the next the next step in industry. People won't need to be involved in industry. We can all do fun, crazy things like this. Think how think how brilliant that's going to be. Now, obviously, such a excellent advance is going to be a little bit expensive, <laughs> which is why it's an auction. So uh, obviously, a lot of you here have already. Provided minimum bids so that we can decide what our minimum was. So um, I'm going to hand over to my auctioneer now, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm basically going to start doing some maths and figure out what I can buy. He sort of goes over, sits down on a chair. He's a little bit awkward, faffs around a little bit, and then sits. Um, a uh, oh. a gentleman, sort of a peacock waistcoat, waistcoat very very posh, well to do, chin up, steps out onto the stage, goes over to the lectern. Thank you very much, Mr. Edison. Uh, the bidding will begin at um, 700 white gold, and uh, naturally we're expecting a larger amount. So, uh, without further ado, uh, 700 white gold from the, our Japanese representative. It's a nod. The bidding starts. Um, it's, it's a very ordered affair. It's not people yelling or anything like that. There's a couple of muttered conversations and so on. But, uh, yeah, the, the bidding starts. It climbs up. And given that it starts at, for future reference, by the way, I have mentioned this in the world building, white gold for the sake of maths in Pathfinder, I personally rule white gold as 1,000 gold. Because um, it's just easier, because a lot of things come in the thousands and it's easier to just go one white gold. 
in terms of like purchasing power parity or whatever, what would that buy you? Um, so, um, like one white gold that is a thousand gold. Uh, one white gold is a wealthy person's yearly salary. Okay. I don't mean like a billionaire's yearly salary, but if um, if you think of it's something like I believe fifty gold is the yearly salary of someone who is getting by. Okay. So it's it's a solid investment. So like their their, their minimum bidding is actually quite high. Um, the figures that are being bandied around, your family could have been bought and sold a yeah. number of times at their at their at biggest their peak. peak. Yeah. Um, Hamid will be familiar with the kind of figures that are involved, but your family have been involved in moving money between states. For Zolf, this is this is like when people talk about billions in terms of like the stock market. It has no real world value Much to you. Muchness. Similarly to Sasha, yeah. like. No idea. You wouldn't need to have known numbers this high. <laughs> like, this won't have come up in your life. Mm. Unless you sat and counted grains of salt, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, the bidding bidding picks up. Can everyone give me perception checks? Yes. Nat 20. Anyone higher than a nat 20? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have uh, six, including modifiers. And uh, 18. 18, Bryn? Uh... 13 plus 6, 19. 19? And a total of 24 on the net. Sure. So basically everyone apart from Bertie, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I put my helmet on the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> He's sat there going, I can't turn the lights off. Wait. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, you guys notice that um, a few people in the crowd are just already out of it. Like they heard the minimum bid and went, oh, pff, pff. they're not leaving, but they're just sat there with arms crossed waiting to see what happens. Um the representatives, um, which are basically, there's sort of three diplomats, it looks like. They're sat prim, proper suits. And um, one of them looks vaguely familiar to Hamid. Um, but you, you can't put a name to the person, it's probably just a face you've seen. Um, Can I try knowledge and ability? No, no. it wouldn't okay. work. Um, basically, they, um, they'll put the occasional bid in, but it's very, very reserved. It's very orderly. Um, Byron... Um, doesn't really seem to be paying particular attention. Um, his his attention wandered. Um, but you also notice, as you know, the the waiters are moving through, and you know they're still taking empty glasses from people. They're not giving any more alcohol, but you know it's an auction, so uh, I'm sure some will be along soon. Um, the bidding ranks up, and uh, Edison starts starts chuckling to himself. He keeps waving at people. Um, one person waves and realizes they've just bid, and has a hairy moment where they think <laughs> they've had to just spend their entire country's wealth before they, you know, the bidding moves on. But um, what you do notice, though, you three, is that the waiters are working their way sort of forwards towards the towards the front because they've sort of walked their way from the back to the front. Anyway, there is a um, there is sort of it's things are drawing to a close. The time between the bids is starting to slow down a bit, and it's pretty much between um, the diplomat from Japan um, and a. Basically, it was the one that you recognised earlier. Deputy, Deputy, Prime, Deputy Minister. Prime Minister. She's actually doing the bidding herself. She doesn't have someone bidding for her. And basically, it's between those two, and they're they're slowing down. Um, the figures are enormous, Lud- ludicrously enormous. Um, it's very clear that a, a select group of people have already been able to see and examine the thing ahead of the auction. Um, it begins slowing down, and then the auctioneer sort of he's standing there with his gavel. So we have a uh, final bid. Any any further takers? Any further takers? Going once, going twice. Pause for a sec. Who is immediately in front of me in the seating arrangement? Immediately in front of you would be Dr. Colgate. <laughs> um, I would like to just give the seat in front of me a bit of a nudge to try and startle Colgate into reacting. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> what would I need to roll to do that? Um, I, I'll just let you do it. Okay. Okay, so you just you just nudge him. Ten. Um, <laughs> he, he, he gives a bit of a, a thing, turns around, lo- looks at you. Uh, is that a bit we see in the corner? No! <laughs> no, that, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is not. Does he go very white? Does he go whiter than white? <laughs> You're on thin ice. <laughs> and not, not the minty ice that you can put yeah, on your yeah, tongue yeah. that dissolves. Okay. You be careful, young man. Can I, can I roll a perception check on these waiters that are moving yeah, sure. nearer to the thing? Yeah. I'm, I work security now. <laughs> I'm taking my job seriously. Um, 
Oh, no, I don't perceive very much. That's a three. That comes a nine. Nah, they're uh, humans, basically, roughly. Basically, basically, they're at the front. You see yeah. that they've they've worked their way from the back of the room to the front of the room for the final bid. So, do I get anything for the nat or uh, on the natural twenty for the perception from earlier? Yeah, I'm oh, leading into that. it. Fine. Ah. Yeah. Um, so, as he's sort of drawing near to the close, Zolf, you specifically, basically see um, one of them is one of the waiters is just reaching underneath his clothing, um, and then just as the gavel comes down, he goes. So, final call. He starts bringing it down. Um, I'm going to start to move forward. Sure. Like when, I, when, I, when, when I see him start to put his hand in, in the obvious, I'm going to bring out a weapon kind of way, start to walk forwards. Basically, get in range for an icicle if I need to. Sure. You basically start running forward. The guy who you're looking at just yells really clearly, No! No, 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 no! At which point, presumably, you launch your icicle. Yep. An icicle starts um, firing across. At which point there is a massive explosion, a huge explosion. Um, all of you are, it's kind of like that bit from Saving Private Ryan, you know, there's a and then it's just ringing in the ears. Mm -hmm. All of you are kind of Where exploded. blacked out. It feels like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically what I'm going to say is that you are all immediately knocked over. None of you, you've all lost vision and sound briefly. Uh, and as you're coming to... I will get you guys to roll initiative. Mm. Okay. So, <coughs> Lydia, initiative. Four. Four. Ben. Five. Ooh, big numbers here. Bryn. Nineteen. Nineteen. James. Nine. Nine. Okay. So, looking around the music room, and um, just got the battle map here. Uh, there's craters all over the place, and um, the bits in black are enormous holes in the floor where it's just broken through into a sort of um, a cellar. There's clearly a fire down there. There's a few bits of the room are on fire as well. We have uh, Colgate and Byron are off to the left-hand side of the auditorium. Yep. Byron is clearly unconscious. Colgate appears to be tending to him. <laughs> um, we have Sasha and Zolf towards the back. Uh, the back left is pretty much gone in a crater. The back right, the diplomats appear to be okay, but are behind a large, basically, wall of fire. Um, they appear to be trapped. The magical spell, wall of fire, or no, a, a patch a, of fire? A patch of fire that is quite high, almost wall height. <laughs> a small W. Well, welcome, to, <laughs> welcome to Pathfinder, where that kind of clarification is actually required. Um, so yeah, they're trapped, basically caught between um, craters that they can't get past and a uh, fire which appears to be working its way towards them. One of them is sort of trapped beneath some kind of um, masonry or something similar. Clearly chunks of the ceiling have fallen in as well, um, so there's piles of stuff, yep. Uh, is the ceiling continuing to fall down or...? Looks unstable. Okay. Um, the three guys that we can see up near the stage are the two waiters that were making their way forward are both sort of flanking the stage and facing towards the audience. And there is a third um, one who is standing over what looks like the dead body of the um, auctioneer, right next to a gaping hole in the stage where the simulacrum was. Mm -hmm. um, almost every other member of the assembled people who were here bidding are dead. Oh. The police commissioner, gone. Uh, Wellington and Chessington, gone. All of the no. old crowd are gone. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, she's gone. How did Bertie... So, so I assume it's because the, the, the explosion was focused on the mass of people in the centre. It Basically, it's a bit of a bodge job, but yeah, they were trying to get rid of all of the people in the centre, like get as, cause as much problem and get rid of as many people as possible, and also get rid of the simulacrum. Well, I've come in fancy dresses as a tank. So I'm <laughs> yeah, fine. basically, Bertie sitting in the middle was wearing armor. It's very clear. Like, I'm, I'm going to start with you guys prone, but it's clear that your armor is basically the reason you're alive. You guys were okay because you were towards the back and only working your way forward. You were okay because you were right at the front, and obviously they didn't want to blow everything up. Um, you guys are all coming to prone. So um, mechanically, try to make sure that your the base of your miniature is in the square that you were going to be, just so we can keep track. Um, yeah, something like that. 
Um, for people who are listening at home, prone um, is basically your character is on their back. Um, there's a, a bunch of mechanical uh, modifications to it. What it means is that you need to spend a move action to stand up, um, a full move action, but um, you can still do stuff from prone, but you're taking penalties. It, there's a few situations where it's better to lie on your back and do the doing in Pathfinder. Um, and for all of the grammar people who uh, obsess over words, there is no supine in Pathfinder. There is only prone. So if you're lying on your front, it's still known as prone. There's your, there's your fun fact. <laughs> it's not that fun, is it? No. <laughs> like, vocabulary pedants might take issue with that. <laughs> okay. Um, what fun means? Oh, oh. Oh. Well, actually, I think you'll find. Oh. Now, the only way to beat this challenge is by telling me pi to 16 places. Okay. Oh. Um, so, in order. We have Hamid. You basically, when I'm saying that it's your turn at this point, this is you getting your stuff together and being like, what happened? You basically have what I just described happening. Uh, those are the um, servants that we're talking about. The waiters. The waiters. Waiter, waiter, and third one. These two appear now to be wielding um, where is it? Uh, a short sword. One of them's wielding. Another one appears to be holding some kind of flask of something, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right of the stage are is holding a sword. And so that guy on the left has the flask? Yes. And those two have swords? Yes. Gotcha. Uh, the guy at the back isn't holding any weapons. Oh, right. The guy who's on the stage isn't holding any weapons. He appears to be faffing near the piano, uh, behind the piano, you don't know what. Oh, Edis Edison, by the way. Uh, Edison is dead, oh. I should spell out. Dead <gasps> yeah. I, or at least I he appears dead. <laughs> he's sort of fallen from. The, oops, sorry, he's fallen from the stage next to one of the servants. It looks like, and the servant who's holding a, um, a flask is faffing with um, Edison. Don't know why. Um, so, sword, sword, flask. Yes. Uh, no, sword, flask, nothing. With the guy at the back at the moment. Sword, flask, nothing. Okay. Yes. So, Bryn. I Hamid. rise from prone. Yep. Um, and move one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> What's your move speed? No, oh, I'm a halfling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, to spell out, by the way, for people who are asking, when it comes to move, you can trade your standard action, so the doing thing phase, for another move. So he can use one move to stand up and then another move, but he wouldn't be able to do anything else. Four. Four squares. Because your move speed being 20. Indeed. And the squares are obviously five foot each. Um, so that's your turn? Yep. Okay. So. I I'm just taking stock of the room. Basically, sure. Assessing um, everything that we've just discussed. First thing that happens, uh, the guy who's holding a flask clocks you standing up and, and backing away, just um, sort of flicks his finger with the flask and hurls it straight at Hamid. Okay. Uh, where is my d20? Ah, there it is. Thank you. Okay. Ooh, that's a fine hit. So that's rolling a 19. Um, we're not into the uh, crit for it, but nonetheless, uh, would a 21 hit? Yes. <laughs> As so, a magic user, yeah. yes. How many hit points you got? Some. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you are going to be taking, let's see how much you get. Three fire damage. Uh, you don't catch fire, it doesn't have that as an option, but basically he sees you, chucks it over one of the craters, and it, it just cla- uh, He will be first to die! <laughs> <laughs> it, it shatters against your shoulder, it doesn't make it through um, a lot of your clothes, but you're getting kind of singed and burnt, and you've got to take that moment to sort of pat it out. It, it hurts. Yeah. Um, after that we have Bertie. Cool, so I get up. Yep, so stand yourself up, that's your move. Okay. You now can either... You now still have a standard action and a swift action. Uh, help me out there. Okay, so standard action is you can, say, attack someone, cast a spell, or move. Mm -hmm. Realistically, given that you're melee, it will be moving. Yep. A swift action is they're kind of like an extra little action, things that can be done quickly. Um, so stuff like... I would, you know, off the top of your head? Uh, 
the things. Speaking. Yeah. <laughs> like my, my daggers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, um, yeah, your daggers, good example. The most sensible option at this point would be to use your, your standard action to move whilst drawing. Yes. yes. Very much so. Okay, good. Well, in that case, that is what I will do. Um, uh-huh. You won't be able to charge any of them because you'll notice you can only charge in straight lines. Yeah. Charge is a full round action. As oh, yeah, good point. Um, fair point. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've got one, two. You can engage this guy with a with your sort of drawn. I mean, he will get to swing you, at you before you get to swing at him. But you're kind of built for that. Uh, yeah, I think I'm probably comfortable with that. Unless I want to go somewhere in the middle here to make it harder for these guys to reach over here. I should be okay. Okay, all right, I'll do that in that case and move towards... So, move that. yourself. Um, what is my move? What do I... 20, so four yeah. squares. 5, 10, 15, 20. So you're now face-to-face -face with the guy wielding the sword. Yeah. He um, looks less than happy to have drawn the short straw and be facing the tank who seems to be... Oh, t to clarify, uh, for everyone else who can see, uh, Bert, uh, technically Hamid, because he's the one that came to you first. Yeah, Bertie's armour, covered in soot. A lot of scratches, some masonry fallen. I don't Very think, cross. I'm going to be honest, I don't think the lights in your falcon on the helmet are working. <gasps> they got clocked with some masonry. Oh. Yeah, he's not looking pleased to be facing against you. <laughs> Did you draw a rapier or a bastard sword? I mean, you technically this is a fall location. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm after on the bus, it's all I think in this, yeah, shocker. <laughs> in this uh Again, for the sake of simplicity of mechanics, I'll allow you to be having your shield on you. Um, because I'm nice. Thanks. Okay, after Bertie we have M3. Okay, so the guy who is upon the stage, holding nothing, um, he, he sort of faffing behind the piano, stands up. Everyone give me a perception roll. Six. 22. Ooh, 22 from Sasha. 25. 25 from uh, Hammond. One. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, that actually makes sense because Sasha's only just sort of meant to be coming too. Yeah, and no, I'm, I'm still out. Welcome to the inside of my helmet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very spacious in here. <laughs> So uh, both, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to make it. Um, I'm going to make it Hamed actually, just because you're still a bit KO. Um, Hamed can see the guy has stood up and he's holding what looks like a folder of something. Um, it's it's quite large, like A4 sized. It was it was upon the lectern, quite thick. Um, a portfolio of something, it, basically like a legal doc sized. Don't know what it is, but it's it's fairly thick. Um, he stands up, sees that there are still people kicking around, and then without further ado, jumps down into the hole, um, which is at the stage, and drops down out of, out of view. I'll shout, we need to follow him if we can! <laughs> <laughs> this is over the falling masonry, the yeah. flame, yeah, no, why not? Um, the guy who is facing Bertie... Um, ah! Uh, does his immediate reaction, which is um, he basically takes a swing straight off the bat. Mm -hmm. That'll be a miss. <laughs> uh, I rolled a two, which uh, is nowhere near. I mean, your AC is what, 20? My AC is 20. Yeah, it's... <laughs> okay. um, yeah, he basically, he, he swings and misses. It doesn't even connect with the armour. Um, at which point, we'll take a short ad break. Hi guys, Alex here. Normally we'd put an ad break at this point, letting you know about new developments at Rusty Quill, mention sponsors, or just recommend other shows that we think you'd enjoy. But today, we just want to take the time to thank you. It takes a lot of time and effort and money to make podcasts like this, and it means a lot to us that you've decided to listen, so thank you. You're awesome. In fact, you are so awesome that we want to keep making great content for you and introduce you to loads of new shows, but in order to do that, we need your help. The more listeners that we get, the more content we can make. It's as simple as that, and the best way that we can get listeners is by word of mouth. In the credits at the end of the episode, we include details about how you can get involved online, but honestly, the best way that you can help us is by recommending us to people that you know. Tell a friend, tell a co-worker, tell your pet iguana. If just one of the people or lizards that you talk to subscribes, that's going to be a huge help to us. We're looking forward to making loads more content for you in the future, and we want to share it with everyone that you care about. So thanks again for getting involved, and we hope we get to meet you, your friends, and all your lizards real soon. Well, that's everything for now, so sit back, relax, 
and let's get back to the show. Uh, Zolf, you basically get your get your stuff together. You must be in pencil. I Cheers. stand. <laughs> Takes you twenty minutes. And takes a fifteen minute. <laughs> Actually, do you have to? Do you take a penalty for standing up with? Um, uh, not that I. I don't believe there is one, but I'm asking because obviously yeah. you've done the research. Not yeah, not that I was aware. I think. Okay, cool. The, the That's hill. fine. Um, if I need to do it in an acrobatic way, there'd be a minus three. But uh, <laughs> if you were trying to do anything acrobatically with a peg leg, I'd have a problem. With that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I will uh, run. I think. Okay. Uh, which gets me. <laughs> run is a full round action. I won't run. Oh yeah, you can't because you're, you're wasting your move action. So. Um, I will walk and draw. <laughs> <laughs> really, ten foot is your yeah. move. Yeah, he's, it's not fifteen. No, nope. he's a peg-legged dwarf. I Think want you to know this campaign has chase sequences. <laughs> That's fine. I have my floating discs. Soon I will be able to scoot about, <laughs> or I'll get roller skates. <laughs> no, what? Is, I thought it was a five-foot penalty for the peg leg. Um, not from the uh, research you, I you, did. You, you, yep, you, you know what? Take believe. take a bit of time to have a look again, just on the off chance, because that'll massively change the game. Cool. Uh, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, Sasha, you're up. Uh, up. Uh, draw my daggers. Crink! I got the spring loads. And uh, and then I come over to be in the position to fly. Yeah, uh, it's so going to be too far this turn. I think. Yeah, I know. So I got six to now. Because I can't do two yeah, yeah. diagonals in a row. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can. It's just that Actually, cost power. wise, it. Yeah. So so yeah. the first diagonal is one, but the second diagonal is. Two. Yeah, so we, we, yeah, we went over that uh, like yeah. um, first episode, five, five foot, ten foot, five foot, ten foot. Okay, so you've moved um, between, <laughs> you've overtaken Zolf incredibly easily, and you're in between him and uh, Bertie, who's yeah. engaged in melee combat with someone who's regretting the decision. Mm. And a quick update, it does take ten foot off of my uh, move. <laughs> yeah, I, it sounded about right to me. Okay, um, in the meantime, um, the diplomats in the corner start crying out for help. The fire appears to be creeping towards them. Uh, so, they, the two who are still sort of with it, pull the uh, their downed comrade, looks like the Japanese diplomat, um, right back into the corner. Um, they're crying, oh, help, please. Uh, could you please help me? Help me! Um, yeah, obviously they're trapped. Um, Hamid, you're up. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Pathfinder, because everything that just happened happened simultaneously. Sort of. Sort ish. of ish. Turn based combat, you gotta love it. I cast magic missile on the guy who hurt me. Yep. <laughs> you are nothing if not vengeful. I do two points of damage to him. <laughs> So in, you're so enthused today. Okay. Oh, it's sad when you have a d4 and you roll a 1. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A d4 is so unimpressive to begin with. <laughs> Make sure to keep calling out your rolls as you roll, as you, uh, roll them short so that we can follow the maths of it. Okay. Uh, the guy who um, basically was facing off against you, uh, who threw the oil, yep. draws uh, some more oil, chucks it at you again. Another fine hit <laughs> for one fire damage. Oh, exchanging ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a war of attrition. We're going to shave each other to death. <laughs> I, need, I need some cover and a pencil. <laughs> uh, as he chucks it, he calls out to the one, Guys, away! Mm. Um, Bertie, you're up. Cool. Uh, I'm going to attack. Him with my sword. Mm -hmm. Big sword. Big sword. Big sword. Uh, right, so we're in D10 plus three. Mm -hmm. Two plus three is five. Five? No. No. You have to hit him. First. Oh, oh okay. sorry. Yeah, I did wonder what I've you were... done all of that wrong because I don't know what I'm doing. That's fine. What, what do I do? So, um, when you're facing off against him, yep. um, you roll your D20, assuming that you're doing uh, an attack. Yes. Yeah. So, 
So your attack bonus with your Bastard Sword is four. So you, you roll a d20 and add four. Three. Three. So you have a total of... Seven. Yep. Which will not be enough to hit. Which is not going to be enough to hit him. Um, when actually doing attacks in Pathfinder, I can't remember if I spelled this out. A person who's rolling the attack adds their base attack bonus and their roll. And then if it matches, matches, mind you, the AC, which is the armor class of the opponent, which is sort of a factor of sort of their dexterity, how much mm -hmm. armor they're wearing, mm -hmm. things like that, then that counts as a hit. And after that, you then are rolling in damage and so on. Okay. So, with that in mind, that happens. Thing you can't see. Uh, and then, the guy facing off against Bertie takes a... Hmm. Uh, let's say that he'll he'll toe to toe. He'll try toe to toe toeing for now because he needs to buy a bit more time. <laughs> Rolls a two again. <laughs> takes another massive swing. It's so this guy is constantly rolling twos. Who's attacking the guy in massive armor with loads of hit points? Yep. This guy who's attacking the squishy, squishy wizard is constantly rolling 17. 18, 17, 18, 18 17. <laughs> what can I say? It's, it's We live in the worst of all possible <laughs> worlds. <laughs> okay. Um, Zolf, you are up. Yay. Um, so the... Starting to regret that peg leg, eh? No. It's a character <laughs> decision that I made. Um, Can't you fire some water at the fire or something? No, no. no, I've been scouring my spells. Best I can do is maybe fire an ice at it, but that's not actually got much water in it. Mm -hmm. um, this crater, though, here. Yeah. When do you say crater? So the fall, ha the fall, the floor has fallen away. Um, the timbers which were holding up the floor have have broken as well. It looks like about a thirty foot drop um, into what was clearly a wine cellar, like a, a large wine cellar. Um, but there's lots of broken crates down there. It, it's it's actually it looks like there's a layer of wine upon the cellar floor. Um, lots of broken casks, uh, broken metal, masonry down there, um, and the flooring around the crater looks quite weak. Um, it should be okay, but to put it bluntly, bluntly, Mr. Pegleg wouldn't be able to say do a running leap. No, that's um, fine. That wasn't my plan. Okay. Um, uh, that said, if any of you, I will make a point of. You'll some of us were thinking. Of making sure. Running you'll leap. notice that um, I've only described the floor. If it's if you want to get into things like are there balconies, are there such chandeliers and stuff, I'm going to expect you guys to ask me. I'm going to give you the basics, and then if you're looking to get environmental and clever with me. It's on you. There is a thing in Pathfinder where you can spend basically a turn doing like a focused perception check or something similar. Um, I'm gonna only if, if I'd only do that if you're looking for something really specific. If you're looking to see is there chandeliers, you know, it's not something that you're gonna have to go. Hmm. I'm gonna take six seconds, look up, consider, compare that. And you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, there's there's a floor that looks like it leads down into a wine cellar that's also been annihilated. Cool. So. My action is move to, mm -hmm. um, scream at the top of my lungs, mm -hmm. get over here to the, diplo uh, di the diplomacy mancers, <laughs> <laughs> the diplomats, yep. and um, then I'm going to cast Stepping Stone there. Okay, uh, draw it on the map for me. And do you have the spell description for Stepping Stone to hand? Uh, one floating disc. Um, Per four cleric level, one minute per cleric level. It's very. What's the size of the floating disc? It's a five foot disc. Yep. Um, can I do it? Although it's a grid, can I hit uh, it? No, you have to place it upon the grid. I suppose it still turns it to a five foot leap, so I'll put it. Um, I'll be generous and say that that is that this sort of black line is right up. So you've basically made it next to. Yeah, yeah. The edge. Cool. Cool. So you've got now a floating disc over the drop to the wine cellar. Uh, the diplomats obviously we'll here and see you. Yep. Uh, and wave my arms around. Yep. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Sasha. Right. So I was thinking of squish jumping over there and helping them to the doors, but now they will they'll be moving away from the doors because the doors are on the other side of the fire. So it's. Um, what I will chip in and say is remember that people came from on stage. There may be doors behind the stage. A clever man. There may not. They could have just been waiting there. The chat did go down the hole, and you're probably the only person who could get Follow down there him. without dying. You could help me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dying. I could. Um, unfortunately, I'm about as squishy as you are, and I don't really, I don't really fight people face to face. I do side fighting. 
Uh, but yeah, so you, what? So you seem to have the diplomats covered. Bertie is fine <laughs> and will remain fine, fine. forever. Yeah, <laughs> until um, he hits water and yeah. sinks <laughs> like a stone. So that isn't currently holding a weapon, That's so he's true. much easier to hit. Oh yeah. yeah, he's been drawing a weapon every time, and because he doesn't have presumably quick draw. He's having to waste time doing so. But also, if he tries to do it again, you you would get an attack of opportunity. If you're up in his face. And do people count as um, might be a different system, but people count as flat-footed if they're in armed combat with no weapon. Um, what? They how, how, no, how Pathfinder kind of works is that you provoke an attack of opportunity if you attack unarmed. Right. Okay. So if I was trying to hit you with a fist. I automatically, before my attack even gets to connect, you get to have a hit on me. Right, okay, sure. um, they don't have a thing where if you're unarmed, you basically just have to take everything on the chin. It sure. doesn't, doesn't really work like that. Right. Uh, Although no doubt Deputy Bryn will correct me. Um, I'm just I'm, checking because I don't remember the rule. Sure, sure. One thing I should probably check that might be a bit more complex mm -hmm. is, so I've written down daggers for throwing. Uh -huh. Is it the same? It's exactly the same item. Um, later well, I mean, do I have the same rolls and everything if uh, I sneak it, up? You will do, stamp. because um, your dex, you're yeah. using dex to hit. That's very true. Um, so it, it's yes. one of the cool things is that it doesn't really yeah. affect you. What I would say, though, is you have to remember to factor in those range increments. Yeah. Because your daggers are basically, you have no penalties, you're very accurate over 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Then obviously 20, you're taking a penalty. 30, you're taking a penalty. 40, you're taking a penalty. And it's meant to reflect just you know standard mechanics. So the further it is, harder okay. to hit. So what I think I might do. So how high is the stage? Uh, the stage is five foot off the ground. Uh, and if I've got my lovely acrobatics skill, does that does that present a big difficulty for me, or is that is is that step up something I need to think about when I'm thinking about moving up to say? For the sake of factoring it in quickly, I'd say that it is the standard because it's only five feet. Normally, with acrobatics, how it works is if you move through a space uh, using acrobatics, it negates the penalties of movement, but takes twice as much movement as a flat standard. So, you could get up on that stage, uh -huh. and even though you're only moving one square laterally, which is five, um, if you roll counts successfully, it yeah. counts as ten. Uh -huh. It sounds like it's a bad trade, but once you start doing things like on a rooftop, where if you were to not do acrobatics and get it wrong, you fall off, suddenly those penalties start looking a lot fairer. Yeah. So if I move one, two, three, four, five, yep. that's my total. Um, bear in and then mind, I'm within 10 feet of him to throw. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, 5, 10, or 5, 10, you're one square short. The, the way it works for the range increment for you would be there can be one, if you want to be at maximum range increment, uh, sorry, minimum range increment, yeah, so, so with no penalties, so there can only be one square between you and him, like an empty square between you, because it's five into that empty square and then five from the empty square into his square. Oh. But you could still throw, the penalty is only something like minus one. Yeah, but my attack bonus is one. So you'd just be you'd be doing a flat roll against yeah. his AC, which at first level's not actually that terrible. That mm. that starts being silly when you're getting a plus ten, he's getting a plus fifty. But at these levels, it's not, not too much of an issue. I don't. Um, yeah. I mean, I might as well do that. It's yeah. Okay. That that sounds fun. Uh, I think I end up there. Okay. And you're gonna take the dagger throw? Yeah. Go for it. Um. So. So you're rolling a d twenty to yeah. hit. So you asked me for this Hamid. You asked someone to come over, d but. Twenty. Uh, I throw tiny knives. <laughs> Remember, there are two of them. Four. That won't hit. No. Sixteen. Uh, when throwing, you don't get to use a two-weapon bonus, do you? Um, it, it's irrelevant. You can't take multiple attack actions unless you're taking the full attack action, which is a yeah. full round action. So you, you, you wouldn't be able to throw both. Uh, what that means is... Why was I able to use both last time, then? You have to already be standing next to someone. Oh, OK. If you're not... if you if So so the normal thing is a, stand, a, a move and a standard. Right. A standard is a single attack. OK. If you forego your move, you can take something called a full attack, which allows you to attack multiple times. So the, even with the two weapon fighting stuff, you can only take the two attacks when you're in position and ready. To when use you're it. in position and ready and taking the full attack. It's something we haven't spelled action. out before to you, which was foolish actually. But effectively, what it means is it becomes it comes into play at higher levels a lot more because everyone starts getting a second attack, a third, whereas yeah. you'll be getting four attacks, five attacks. 
Uh, so all it means is, if you move and then try and hit someone, uh -huh. you only get to make one attack. Uh -huh. If you have moved, are in position, okay. and are engaged in a fight, then you get to use all of your massive okay, like yeah. numbers. But even when throwing, unless you took a, a, like a multi-throwing feat, yeah. two weapon is for the for the melee fighting. Okay, it doesn't okay. just give you two attacks every single time. I wish I'd chosen something simple like a bastard sword. Uh, the I've thing just got plethora of daggers. <laughs> the thing with yours is that what, honestly, having played it before, it was the first character I ever played was a, t a two-handed rogue. I got really, really intimidated at first and didn't really get the hang of it. Yeah. And then suddenly it actually becomes quite straightforward because it limits your options. The thing that I find when it's just, I hit it, yeah. there's so many options that you start getting that kind of choice paralysis. Okay. Whereas as a rogue, it's very much, how do I engineer the situation so that I'm behind this person yeah. one turn ahead? Uh. It's, it's more puzzly, I suppose. I think of the combat yeah, yeah. as more of a puzzle for rogues. Um, but yeah, so that was useless. Uh, <laughs> I think someone else is up. Uh, We'll just do these uh, diplomats. So they um, basically start dragging their fallen comrade. So they will go five, ten, 20. And drag their fallen comrade to there. Um, so they will next turn be able to start getting onto that floating disc. And I believe we're going to have to call time on this episode. Um, we will pick this up right where we left off next time. Uh, but until that time, thanks for listening. It's always it's always good to have someone listening in, and uh, that's uh, goodbye from me. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good one. Rusty Quill Gaming is a podcast distributed by RustyQuill.com and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial International License. Today's episode was recorded and produced by Alexander J. Newell. To comment on episodes, make donations, and view links, images, videos, and show notes, visit rustyquill.com. Rate and review us on iTunes. Visit us on Facebook. Tweet us on Twitter at the Rusty Quill, or email us at mail at rustyquill.com. Thanks for listening. Give me a bit of a wiggle. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so. More oh, wiggle than you expected. <laughs> <laughs> click, 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 click. Okay, cool. nom, 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 nom. Thanks. She could have come through a time portal. She could. You could be a that. space pirate that has dragged her through a time portal. Yep. And through a murder scene and in I a would, country house. Yeah. A space country house. Like you've, gone, you've gone back in time to prevent the murder or to solve the murder, right? And you mm. brought your rag dag clue, rag bag crew and are and have fallen for the, the mistress of the house when you turn up. Yeah. We could at least write this comic. <laughs> <laughs>